I'm sure that um, the ranking member is on his way back. We, under the rules, we can proceed with two members. And I'm going to begin because we have more votes in an hour, and we can start uh, introducing our witnesses now while Kevin is on his way. Um, I'd like to ask all the members of the next uh, panel to uh, come forward. And I'm searching for my introductions here. We have uh, three uh, witnesses before us. We have um, the Honorable Mark Ritchie, who is uh, currently serving as Minnesota's Secretary of State, where he's the uh, state's chief elections officer. Mr. Ritchie has made many contributions to improving uh, civic participation in the electoral process, including his leadership of National Voice, a national coalition of over 2,000 community-based organizations uh, working together to increase voter participation. Mr. Ritchie was able to lead this organization in registering over 5 million new voters nationwide, one of the largest nonpartisan voter mobilizations in our nation's history. Uh, we, next, we have uh, Mr. Tim Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore currently serves as a representative in the North Carolina House of Representatives. He was first elected in 2002 and now serves as chairman of the Campaign on Elections Law and Campaign Finance Reform uh, Committee. Mr. Moore is also an attorney with the law firm of Flowers, Martin, Moore, and Ditz. Uh, and finally, we have Mr. Neil Albrecht, who is the Assistant Director, uh, City of Milwaukee Elections Commission. He has been the Deputy Director uh, for the City of Mo uh, Milwaukee's Election uh, Commission since July of 2005. His focus in this position has been on the full implementation of system improvements identified by the Milwaukee Task Force on Elections. He is a lifelong resident of the city of Milwaukee and has a professional background in finance and uh, nonprofit management. And we do uh, thank uh, all of you for coming today to share your uh, insights with us. And we, if we could, uh, we will begin with um, the Secretary of State, Mr. Ritchie. Welcome. Let me, let me just uh, interrupt and note that your uh, full written comments will be made part of the official uh, record of this hearing. We do ask that your oral testimony consume about five minutes, and that little machine there has lights, and when the yellow light goes on, it means that you've consumed four minutes. It's always a surprise. And when the red light goes on, it means you've actually t spoken for five minutes, and we'd ask you to try and summarize at that point so that we can hear everybody. Mr. Ritchie. Uh, your micro, there's a little button. There we go. Chairwoman Lofgren. Representative Davis, thank you for this opportunity to present testimony on Election Day registration. When I was, began the process of running for the Office of Secretary of State, one of the first persons I sat down with and asked his support was the Secretary of State of Minnesota who was serving in that position when I came of age, uh, when they lowered the voting age, um, Arlen Erdahl. Uh, Arlen Erdahl had been a congressman, a Republican congressman from Minnesota, had come back to Minnesota, was Secretary of State when Election Day registration was passed and implemented in our state. He gave me an amazing history of the process, uh, particularly pointing out the problems that were being solved um, at that time by that, uh, uh, making that change. But he also urged me to go meet with and talk to all of our 87 county election officials and to get their point of view because, as he said, county election officials, city election officials, that's where the rubber hits the road. If you want to know about Election Day registration, its uh, benefits and how it uh, functions, go talk to those officials. So I did. And in meeting around the state, and I have met with all 87, I heard four consistent themes about Election Day registration in Minnesota. So this is based on 34 years of experience, uh, and some of these uh, um, election officials um, have been in, in their jobs uh, for most of that time. Number one, it clearly has uh, increased turnout, but it's been especially important for increasing turnout for young people. Minnesota was on a decline from 1956 uh, to the early 1970s and with the introduction of the 18-year-old voting in this country, uh, uh, another hit on participation. But we passed Election Day registration at roughly the same time, and so we've been able to build up over the past few years uh, so that we are 
top in the nation, but especially we're proud of the fact that it brings in young people. Um, in fact, election day registration has been shown to have about uh, twice the positive impact on bringing young people into the process um, as older adults. The second thing that election officials pointed out is that this has uh, largely eliminated the disputes, the problem, the mistakes. Uh, it just made election administration much easier and much cleaner, much less expensive, and allows election officials to do their job better. Third, it's a much more accurate and secure system. Um, you are registering somebody in person, they're standing in front of you, instead of a, a form received in the mail. If there's some error in, uh, in the registration form, a hard to read, poor writing, uh, some missing information, you can correct it right there on the spot. And we have a whole series of safeguards, including um, requiring our, our, our proofs, our oaths. Uh, we have provisions for challenging. And of course, we have criminal prosecution for anyone who's lying under oath. So we feel like it has been, been a much better and more accurate and secure system. And finally, since most of the um, same-day registrations are um, simple address changes, we also think that there are some ways to um, you know, make this great system even better in the future, and so we're looking forward on that. I took their comments and their suggestions to heart in my campaign, and, and now that I'm in this position, and, um, and Minnesota is going to be an even uh, better and stronger um, uh, participant in the Election Day registration process. But what I've noticed is that many other states are very interested because they have the problems of provisional ballots and other problems. They're asking us uh, for our advice, for our help. Many other states have come to visit Minnesota to look at our system. I always have those visitors meet with local election officials because those are the folks who really know how the system works. They've seen every problem, every unusual situation, and they've tackled those um, very well. And so Minnesota at this point uh, is a state where this system works for us and it works well. Uh, in the closing of um, Congressman Ellison's comments this morning, he, uh, he quoted from my colleagues, Secretary of State from Idaho and from Maine, about how this is not a partisan issue this is an issue that is in favor of voters, and I want to underline that. Our 87 county election officials are very, very fiercely independent, and they range from all spectrums of the political climate in Minnesota, and they all feel strongly that this is a great system. Our 34 years of history gives us great confidence, and we're very happy to see this idea being adopted in other states and potentially at the national level. Madam Chairwoman, thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Ritchie. I see that our colleague, Mr. Ellison, has joined us, and by unanimous consent, we will invite him to participate uh, with us. And we are now joined by our ranking member, Mr. McCarthy, in time for Mr. Moore's testimony. Proceed, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member McCarthy, members of the committee. It's really an honor to be here today speaking before this committee, both as a citizen and as a member of the North Carolina State House of Representatives. I'm here today because our General Assembly recently, this past session, enacted same-day voter registration in North Carolina through the enactment of House Bill 91. I opposed that measure in the General Assembly because I felt like there were real concerns with a number of issues to protect against voter fraud and that we, we failed to fully address that. Support for same-day voter registration is, of course, based upon the noble intention of increasing voter turnout. Uh, but I don't think any member of this committee or this Congress would also doubt that we also have to be equally vigilant, not only about voter turnout, but, but accuracy and legitimacy in the elections to prevent against fraud. Um, the, uh, this, this process uh, first started actually, or this, this past week, the uh, elections which were held for a lot of municipal elections is the first time same-day voter registration has occurred in North Carolina. The data I've seen thus far indicates that it has not had an impact on the voter turnout. So I guess that remains to be seen. The canvas has yet to occur, and that, that will be fleshed out in the coming weeks. But at least tentatively at this point, the data does not show there was an increase in turnout, at least in North Carolina, in the municipal elections. But the same-day voter registration does have the very real potential to decrease confidence in the elections, particularly if there are increases in the amount of fraud. And I'll point out two examples to kind of show it. Um, I suppose if the only goal was to, turn, was to increase voter turnout, we could take a cardboard box, cut a hole in it, and put it on the street corner, and leave it there for a couple of days, and come back and pick it up. You'd probably have an increase in voting in that precinct. 
but it's obvious what the concerns for fraud would be. Someone could stuff the ballot box or anything. There are other uh, ludicrous examples where you could require fingerprint ID or something like that. The point is there has to be a balance struck between voter security and between ease of voting. It's my concern that same-day registration at the state level, and particularly with the federal bill, tips that balance dangerously away from ensuring uh, accuracy and, and, f and fairness at the voting. The, uh, the bill that is, uh, that is before Congress is, is similar in some ways, but different in one. One key, uh, one thing I would stress, or one difference I would stress is the fact that in North Carolina, the ballots are provisional ballots. They are retrievable ballots, so if there is a challenge to fraud, it can be, it can be retrieved. But the issue of voter ID really dovetails with, with this, because if we're going to increase the opportunity for voter registration, and at the same time decrease the period of time that the Board of Elections would have to ensure the accuracy and verify the eligibility of the voter. We need to find ways to enhance uh, the security component. Uh, I've supported or I ran an amendment in North Carolina to our bill to add photo ID. Uh, that bill did fail along uh, partisan lines, unfortunately. But I would encourage Congress, if you pass this, that you implement at least a photo ID component because the types of ID that, that HAVA sets forth right now are things that are very easy to fabricate, such as a power bill, and very difficult to verify. Um, the allegations as to, uh, as to fraud, though I think in some ways those may be understated. History is full of examples of where elections have, where fraudulent conduct has affected elections. And anytime we're going to expand the opportunity for that to occur, we need to put in place those protections. Additionally, uh, North Carolina, like many other states across the nation, has seen a huge growth in population, some of those being illegal foreign nationals. In fact, some estimates in our state estimate that as many as a half million of our members of our new population are, fa are folks who are here illegally. By, get it, by getting rid of the period of time that the Board of Elections has to verify the eligibility, we increase the opportunity that we could have those who aren't even citizens voting. So again, I think the photo ID component would be very important. Uh, we, we did at the state level find some examples of voter fraud that were, that were discussed on the floor. One where a person went to vote um, or went to vote on election day and then discovered someone had voted in their place on the uh, early day. They were disenfranchised. There was an example, several examples of where dogs had registered to vote. I think one dog even got some votes. I don't think they voted. Uh, but, but it does appear that, this is, that, th that there is an issue and that there has to be a way to strike the balance. And in some, I will say this, I, I do think that this also is a state issue um, as to election administration. I'm all for finding ways to increase uh, voter turnout and participation. One thing that Congress, I would, would recommend Congress look at doing is finding ways to ensure that the ballots of our military personnel who are overseas are counted. I'm aware there's some problems with some logistical issues getting those back and forth. I would hope Congress would look at ways to, to, to address that. But uh, I do appreciate your time, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. And our uh, last witness uh, on this panel is Mr. Albrecht, and we would be pleased to hear from you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and members of the Could board. you pull the microphone a little bit closer? Maybe it's not on. Uh, there's a button you have to, there you go. Thank you. Good morning. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to represent the city of Milwaukee in this discussion. My name is Neil Albrecht and I am the Deputy Director of the City of Milwaukee Election Commission. My purpose in testifying this morning is to speak to Milwaukee's positive and productive experience, experience administering Election Day registration and also to address the allegation that Milwaukee is a voter fraud city and that election day registration has contributed to a voter fraud problem in the city of Milwaukee. Nationally, use of the words voter fraud have been applied randomly and are often unsubstantiated. In recent elections in Hawaii, there were allegations of widespread voter fraud when six polling sites did not open on time. In Indiana, problems with new touchscreen voting machines were construed as election fraud. In Utah, where poll workers forgot, to forgot a step in setting up a voting machine, there were allegations of voter fraud. It has been our experience in Wisconsin that misrepresentation of these two words is often intentional and has been successful at intimidating and disillusioning voters. Voter turnout 
during the 2004 presidential election was unprecedented. Beyond any dispute, the, the city's election systems were overwhelmed by the sheer volume of pre-election registration and absentee voting activity. Due to Wisconsin's status as a battleground state, the problems that were experienced attracted significant national attention, as did allegations of widespread voter fraud. After both a state and federal investigation into the election, there were two voter fraud prosecutions, and neither related to election day registration. While the act of voter fraud in any elections is not acceptable, two prosecutions hardly warranted the labeling of Milwaukee as a voter fraud city. Fortunately, allegations of voter fraud did not overshadow, overshadow Milwaukee's record-breaking turnout in the 2004 presidential election. 277,535 ballots were cast, representing 70% of the city's 307,000 registered voters. Nationwide, sorry. Nationwide Wisconsin uh, ranked second in voter turnout just below our neighboring state of Minnesota. There were many factors that contributed to Milwaukee's success in motivating to voter turnout, including the city's long-standing history of engagement in political processes. Un uh, unquestionably, the most significant contributing factor, significant contributing factor, was the availability of election day registration. Of the nearly 278,000 voters, over 80,000, or 29%, Re registered to vote on election day. I think it's time to get bifocals. <laughs> In Milwaukee, voting is a citywide event that crosses into every neighborhood, community, gender, age, and economic class. Despite the overzealous and inaccurate allegations of Milwaukee being a voter fraud city, voting as a right is woven deeply and throughout the uh, very cultural diverse fabric of Milwaukee. Election day registration has consistently encouraged voter participation. In Wisconsin, the most recent gubernatorial election, nearly 35,000 of the 172,000 voters who voted on election day were election day registration. That, re that number represents one in five voters. Offering election day registration does require an additional administrative investment on the part of any municipality. Voting rooms are set up to allow separate areas for election day registration so as to avoid long lines and delaying the issuance of ballots to registered voters. In Milwaukee, we provide trained registrars at every polling site. At our 2008, at our 208 sites, this represents of an, an investment of 320 additional election workers, a minimal investment considering the outcome, civic engagement and voter participation. The value of election day registration exceeds increased voter participation. It is also evidenced by the demographics of the election day registrants themselves. Young people, apartment occupants, or people more transient, and persons from the lower socioeconomic classes. During the 2006 gubernatorial election, I received a call from the chief inspector at Riverside High School, a voting site close to the UW-Milwaukee campus, notifying us that they were running out of election day registration applications. On delivering additional applications to the school, I found a, registra a registration line that spanned approximately four blocks long. Nearly every person in that line was a college student. Voters from the neighborhood and school faculty distributed bottled water and power bars to the people standing in line. It is difficult for me to imagine turning away young people from the polls because they did not register 15 or even 30 days prior to the election. In Wisconsin, state law clearly identifies that election day registrants 
must be prepared to provide a proof of residence that includes their name and registration address. The legislature has approved a comprehensive array of acceptable documents similar to HAVA that can include student identification cards, leases, property tax bill, government issued identification, and utility bills. An elector may also uh, produce a corroborating witness who will certify their identity and address. The Mr. level of- Mr. Albrecht, could you try and summarize it? We're a little bit over and we I'm do have sorry. a separate panel. That's all right, we were giving you extra time because you didn't have your bifocals. But, <laughs> but, we, but we do need to, to um, uh, if we could summarize I appreciate conclude, that, that would be great. Elections should be about inspiring and engaging people, particularly young people or people that have been disenfranchised by the political process. In Wisconsin, we do not believe in setting up barriers that prevent students from experiencing the power of casting their first ballot or further disenfranchise the more transient residents of the city or the poor or the elderly with cumbersome ID requirements. Thank you very much and Thank thanks you. to all of our witnesses. Now is the time when uh, we can proceed to questioning for five minutes each and I will turn first to um, Susan Davis, our colleague on the committee from um, California. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of you for being here. I was actually going to ask uh, a question that in some ways, Mr. Albrecht, I think you, you answered partly, but I think that there, in some ways, I mean, there are so many things that need to be done uh, in, in communities to outreach for registration. I would, I, I'm guessing, and perhaps you can clarify for me, that in some ways, same day registration is sort of a last attempt effort in many ways, but, uh, that would suggest that somehow we're not doing everything that we should do beforehand. And so I'm, but I also am very aware of your, your testimony that mm -hmm. largely we're talking about um, college students perhaps uh, and others who have moved who are more transient. Um, Mr. Ritchie, is that your assessment as well? I mean, is there something that we should be doing more prior to or in those areas where we have same day registration now, uh, is it considered, you know, not a last resort necessarily, and it's just the way it is? <laughs> Excuse me. Madam Chair, Representative Davis, Minnesota is similar to Wisconsin in that on large election years, presidential years, it can be 25 percent of our voters. So this is, uh, for us, it's a full spectrum. It's old, young, it's all kinds of people. It does. Uh, represent uh, approximately 80 percent of those people are changing their address, so they are prior registered. They've been in the system, they've moved, and the other 20 percent are just came of age, just moved to the state, or were just recently uh, motivated because a candidate or an issue caught their attention. So I think it is a, a wide range, but what we see is that uh, for young voters, it's, a, it's often of greater benefit to young voters than to others. But I think your question gets to an uh, issue that we're addressing in Minnesota right now, which is how do we get more people into the system earlier? And there are so many benefits to that. As an elected official, of course, we are buying, um, you know, a voter list, that kind of thing for door knocking for, you know, registration purposes for direct mail. And the more people that are registered before, the better are the list. So that's one advantage. The second is that, um, Secretaries of State offices and other organizations like League of Women Voters are distributing information about where to vote, about candidate information, about what's needed. And so the better, the more people registered, the better the information is shared. And then finally, um, it is certainly true that getting people to feel they're part of the process somehow is going to have a positive <coughs> overall benefit. We, um, we don't think of it as necessarily sort of a last ditch effort because so many of our Minnesotans use this, um, mm -hmm. this opportunity, but it's certainly true that we want to do everything in our power to get more people registered before, and we have some specific proposals to begin using U.S. Postal Service data on change of address of being more directly tied into mm -hmm. our other state systems that are requiring citizenship identification. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to provide you with further information about that after I go back to my office. Yeah. 
in, in, in terms of your situation, are you voting with machines or are you, uh, wh what's, what's the method of voting? In? Chairwoman Lofgren, uh, Representative Davis, Minnesota only votes on paper paper ballots, they are counted by optical scan, scan. equipment, mm -hmm. and we have um, HAVA compatible equipment that assists voters in marking their, ba their paper ballots, and then those are um, then used in the optical scan system. And frankly, it's the fact that we vote on paper, that we have same-day registration so everyone is welcome, and we do post-election random audits. Mm -hmm. Those are the three uh, pillars of our yeah. voter confidence. Can, can you help system. me understand if, if, in fact, you have a situation where somebody may um, be in the area, but it's not necessarily their um, precinct, or I, I'm thinking even in terms of you know if they're uh, voting on some county propositions versus city of propositions. How do you how do you deal with that then? If if in fact they just show up in the wrong area, do they are they sent to another area or are they? Can they vote there? Uh, Representative Davis, um, it's a felony to vote outside of your precinct in the state of Minnesota, so we do not uh, permit or allow this. We instruct people, you know, where they need to go. But uh, we are looking closely at the experience in Colorado, which has been uh, really in the forefront of looking at some countywide voter registration systems where you could go to near your workplace or your school. So right now in Minnesota, we don't mm -hmm. have the option of voting outside of our precinct, but we are looking how other states are doing this, and uh -huh. we think there's something there. Mr. Albeck or, or uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moore, is that, are you also voting on paper in Wisconsin? Uh-huh, okay. Thank you. Paper ballots, and then we also have the HAVA mandate equipment for a person with a disability to mark their ballot. Gentle ladies, uh -huh. time has expired. We'll Thank give you, Grant an additional 30 seconds for Mr. Moore to answer, and then we'll go to Mr. McCarthy. In North Carolina, we have, we have both forms, and, and one additional concern in our state is that on this same day voter registration, our early voting, folks actually are voting at places other than their poll sites. A county will set up one, maybe a couple facilities throughout that county, and one other concern there on the identification component is that they may be in a part of the county in which they do not reside, and so no one there would know who they are. And that's, that was one thing we actually raised at the state level. We now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick housekeeping. I have a couple reports that are relevant today. You just ask unanimous consent that they get entered in. Oh, without objection. Thank you so much. Um, first to Mr. Moore. You talked about, um, and, and I agree with your concerns on same-day registration, same-day voting. But what you did in North Carolina is actually different than what's being proposed in this House bill. You allowed uh, for provisional ballots if you're a same-day register and same-day voting. Could you elaborate why? Certainly. The ballots would be retrievable in that case. So if, the, if through the process of, those, of the few days between when the ballots are cast and between the canvas, if it was discovered that the ballot was fraudulent or the person was ineligible to vote, then there would be a means to trace the ballot to the voter and, to, and for the ballot to be retrievable at that point. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to Mr. Ritchie, th thank you for coming in. Um, I read your testimony, I'm sorry I was a little late, but in part of your testimony you said same day registration has actually um, increased turnout. Now, I, I've got this here where they take an analysis and you, you could tell me whether I'm wrong or right here. It says it takes from 52 to 72 because in 73 is when you went to same day registration, correct? The average then was 77 percent turnout and then from 73 now to 2004 the average is 71 percent turnout. So that, that's a decrease but I don't know if decrease across the country people turning out but you still feel even though the numbers don't show it that it does increase turnout. Chairwoman Lofkin, Ranking Member McCarthy. Yes, that's right. In 1956, we started at 83 percent. We fell to 70 percent in 1972, and we extended the franchise to 18-year-old men and women, and we had a further uh, downward pressure on our turnout, and we are now back up to uh, almost 78 percent as of our last presidential election. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry you weren't here for my testimony, uh, but I was referring to my meetings with the county election officials, who are really the experts and who does elections. Well, um, all of them are can, quite can, clear. Can I ask you one thing about your answer, I, and I, I appreciate that. Um, you talked about you, you want to make sure people register beforehand. That, that's your initial goal. 
um, because people are more well informed. And I was just wondering, people use voter lists for a lot of different things, but candidates use them too for um, talking to voters. Do you, do you feel voters that go in and do the same day registration, that they're less informed or more informed because people are mailing their positions and where they stand based upon election records? Uh, Chairwoman Lopgren, uh, Ranking Member McCarthy, 80 percent of our same-day registrations are people who have been registered from one year to 89 years, and so 80 percent of those people uh, have the same level of uh, prior registration as anyone else. So uh, we believe that the people who are registering to vote on Election Day are more or less equally informed. However, young people are generally often less informed because they're new to the process and so it's very important to get more young people directly included we're working hard on that and so there are things that we want to do but generally speaking most of the people using this opportunity are people who've been registered for their entire lives however long they've been adults and uh, they're quite well informed especially in minnesota but of course we are all above average <laughs> well it's good to know I come from California, so maybe I'm a little below. But um, have you found any fraud through this, and have you found through those younger people? I know people, they tell stories, people that are here elected tell that they were a little wilder when they were in their college days, and they, they did things pushing the envelope. Um, have you found, since you, that's a larger portion that goes and votes on same-day registration, that they're voting absentee back home and at the same time going in? Have you had any reports about that? Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member McCarthy, yes, thank you for this question. Uh, almost every major election cycle we find one person who has made the very serious mistake of voting in two places, and it makes me very sad to say it is almost always a young person, and it is often college students who don't understand that this will make it very hard for them to grow up and be a lawyer, which is what happened in one case, or some other. And um, there are things that we do um, as young and older people that we know that are wrong, um, and drunk driving is one, and sometimes there's no consequence, and sometimes there's terrible consequences. And so I make it part of my job to try to communicate to young people, not to scare them away from voting, but saying, look, this is a very serious mistake. And we always find them because we have a statewide system and we well, run all this. Can I ask just one quick follow? I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, I only got a couple seconds. Was that vote counted? Because you, they don't vote provisional, correctly? Correct? That's, that's correct. That vote was counted. And as I say in my state, um, I personally might prefer a system where no person could drive until they proved to me or someone that they weren't drunk or impaired, but that's not our system. And in voting, it's not our system. No, knowing what you know now, how every time you find someone who has broken the law there, W would you change your current law and make um, same-day registration vote provisionally so those votes would not be counted? Absolutely not. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative uh, McCarthy, your proposal, which you asked earlier, would disenfranchise 213,000 Minnesotans in a presidential election year. But they still vote. I don't understand how provisional... If, if, if I'm allowed to do that. Uh, yeah. uh, the ge gentleman Marthy. is granted an additional 30 seconds so the witness can the answer. The national average of, of counted provisional ballots is 63 percent. That's nationwide. Let's say Minnesotans who are above average, it's 70 or 80 percent. That would leave 100,000 Minnesotans disenfranchised by your idea. This would not be something that I would support. Uh, I wish I had more time, <laughs> I guess. The gentleman's you. time has expired. I. Um, will begin. I just, we got a letter from um, Deborah Ross, the majority whip of the North Carolina General Assembly, and I, from her s stationery, I see she chairs the Ethics Committee and Judiciary One Committee and is vice chair of the Election Law Committee. And I, I she disagrees with you, Mr. Moore, and I just wanted to to put in the, uh, I ask you to ask consent to put the letter in the record, but I would note that she uh, reports to us that the director of North Carolina State Board of Election encouraged her as the bill sponsor to use nonstop uh, voting sites as ideal locations, and in a letter 
uh, that he wrote to her, she quotes, a registration application filled out and sworn to in the presence of an election official enhances the accuracy of the information obtained and transferred into our database. In-person registration also enhances a proper review of the identification documentation provided by the applicant. And the new law requires the Board of Elections to verify the address of the applicant through the DMV and other databases. She points out that the, there are many uh, safeguards against fraud and that the, um, in addition to those that the applicants sign under penalty of perjury, that he or she is a U.S. citizen um, and failing to uh, adhere to the rules results in two felonies. And uh, notes that the bill, she says, HR, HB 91 passed with bipartisan support, particularly in the North Carolina Senate. The U.S. Department of Justice pre-cleared the new law within a month of its passage and that the law was used in October and November 2000 municipal elections without incident. So I, I make that part of the uh, record. And I just, you know, I did a search with the internet, you can find a lot of things, but you're never sure if it's entirely accurate. But the only instance I could find of a prosecution of voter fraud in North Carolina was a gentleman who worked for Congressman Patrick McHenry, who voted twice and was indicted. And apparently, he's a young man who made a mistake. He's got reached some kind of plea deal, which I'm happy for him and his life. But I couldn't find any other prosecution. Are you aware of any, Mr. Moore? So a couple of things I made. Uh, when I, I used to actually co-chair the Elections Law Committee with uh, Representative Ross, we had a spirited debate on this issue on the floor of the House. The, uh, the one, one thing we heard was that there were, there were folks who said they went to vote, they weren't able to, and there were allegations of fraud. One of the difficulties about voter fraud, Madam Chair, is it's very difficult to prove, at least that's been the experience, not only in our state, but what I've researched and found in other states. Um, the example I told you where the dog. So, so were there prosecutions? Uh, do you know of any? In Other than past, Mr. Congressman McHenry said? I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any that I can actually cite to you this morning, but I'm aware that there were other investigations. Okay. I, 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 um, I think you answered this, Mr. Albrecht, but this, Mr. McCarthy mentioned the, uh, in his opening statement, I, or I guess it was to the first panel, this uh, task force that looked at Milwaukee and, mm -hmm. and um, how many, pro there were prosecutions that occurred out of it? There out were of two, the prosecutions two prosecutions coming out of the 2004 election. Neither was related to election day registration. Both were occurrences of a person who was on probation or parole for a felony conviction at the time of the election. And so they, under, under state law, they weren't eligible to, to be a voter. Okay. And um, I'm just wondering if any of you can answer. One of the things I mentioned in my opening statement is the uh, situation where sometimes provisional ballots aren't counted. And one of the things that I've thought about is whether there should be standards and procedures uh, so there's uniformity on the counting of provisional ballots uh, because it's sort of an equal you know, justice thing. If, you know, if you're in County A, it gets counted. If you're County B, it doesn't. And it seems like there ought to be some uniformity to you know, whatever the rules are ought to apply to all the, all the Americans so that they're treated the same. Do you have thoughts on why ballots aren't being counted and whether it's a lack of standards or some other reason? Th is anyone who knows the answer? Mr. Ritchie, you might have a thought on that. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I think national standards would be very important, but it would also need to be uh, somehow looked at the overall cost. Provisional ballots are an extremely expensive and time-consuming and complicated process. And so once national standards are under discussion, finding out what are the cost burdens right. uh, on state and local, particularly local um, governments, and so that that could be somehow That's, That would addressed. be an important component. Mr. Albrecht, do you have anything to add on that? I'll grant myself an additional minute so you can answer. I, I would just agree that they uh, can present a, a pretty significant administrative burden and that there's a substantial cost involved with that as well. Of course, under HAVA, you have to have it anyhow, so uh, th I think this is something we'd certainly welcome additional advice on from not just you, you two, but other uh, state election officials. Well, my time has expired, so I will now turn to uh, Mr. Ehlers for his five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, Mr. Ritchie, I 
I was born in Minnesota, so I appreciate your comments that Minnesotans are above average. Uh, that's been my experience, too. It's also been in my experience that the crooks in Minnesota are above average and very clever. <laughs> and I think you should be concerned about that. Uh, in between the first part of this hearing and the second part, we had to go to the floor to vote. And one of uh, my congressional colleagues from Minnesota told me tale after tale of, of dishonest practices, many of them involve, involving same-day registration. So it's, it's not apparently as copacetic as we've been led to believe here. I don't understand the reluctance to have provisional ballots. If you're so worried about the sanctity of the ballot, I think it's essential that, that you have provisional ballots. And you argue the expense. Good grief. It's far more expensive to run an election than to deal with just a, a minor part of it, which is a provisional balance. I, I, it makes me very suspicious when people say, we want same-day registration, but we don't want provisional ballots. That makes no sense. And that leads, leads me to believe people are trying to play games with this. And I, I just cannot abide that. Uh, Mr. Albrecht, I want to turn to you for a moment. In your, after your January, uh, or your, after your election in 2005 or 2004, I understand the Milwaukee Police Department, District Attorney's Office, the FBU, U.S. Attorney, uh, formed a uh, special task force. They found uh, that uh, there are a number of cases in which the number of people who voted exceeded, the, the count was exceeded the, the number of people uh, who actually voted. I'm sorry, the ballots cast exceeded the number of votes. Uh, and there were a number of other improprieties. What, what uh, can you tell us about that? The, the number that you're referencing, which was sort of an immediate post-election disparity between the number uh, of people who had been assigned voter numbers on election day and ballots cast in the machine, was actually recently resolved. There was a uh, number from the formula that uh, law enforcement was missing and that is the people who had registered to vote at City Hall in the 14 days prior to the election. So um, while the final report from uh, the District Attorney's Office has yet to come up the, or be released, the initial significant margin of error that was widely promoted in the media, uh, in fact, uh, proved to be false. Well, we'll be following that with great interest. And I just want to quickly uh, drive, drop back to the issue of cost of provisional ballots. We spent millions, in fact, I suspect it's above a billion, dealing with voting improprieties in, in Florida uh, in 2000. I can't believe that the cost of a provisional ballot comes anywhere near the expense involved in case there is really a legal battle involved about the results of an election. I just think that's totally mistaken assumption and, and statement, and I, I, I cannot accept that. Uh, that's separate from the issue of same-day registration, but I really think it's also crucial to have provisional ballots for those ex exercising same-day registration. I, I'm not a babe in the woods. I wasn't born yesterday. I'm familiar. I've been working on elections for over 30 years. I'm familiar with many, many cases of fraud taking place and sometimes there are victims, as the one, the, the gentleman you mentioned, Mr. Ritchie, who, who uh, was convicted and may have been innocent, but someone told that person to do that. And uh, I have, in contested cases that we've had to deal with in this panel, I found the same thing. There are out, outside forces who are persuading people to do things that are illegal. And we have a case in, in, of a group that was trying to persuade illegal aliens that was perfectly fine for them to vote because they wanted them to vote. But of course, they could be deported immediately for doing that. So I th it's, the, it's the organized fraud I worry about, not the average person who comes in and makes a mistake. But there are people out there who try to influence elections fraudulently, and we, we should be aware of that, and we should guard against that. I uh, will uh, yield any remaining time I have to Mr. McCarthy if he wishes to follow up on anything. Um, the gentleman yields 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the only comment I would make is that your statement about the provisionals, you, you let a vote go that's an illegal vote, knowing it's an illegal vote, 
provisionals majority aren't counted because they're not determining the outcome. JFK was elected by one vote per precinct. President George Bush, 500 votes in Florida. We have congressional members here that are here by 83 votes. I think the accuracy and the trust of election is utmost important. I would say you have to have provisional. Why you go beyond and, and no, knowing that you're gonna have and accept illegal votes in is not a way to move. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Davis, is recognized for uh, five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Let me, I guess, make one observation at the outset. I, I, don't, I don't think anyone on either side of the aisle disputes that we have election fraud uh, that happens. Uh, there's a particular gentleman in Alabama who ran for Congress in a county that had 13,000 people. One problem is he got 16,000 votes in that county. He happened to be my predecessor, so I know that story fairly well. But <laughs> what is interesting to me is we spend a lot of our energy and a lot of our time focusing on just that side of the equation. The other side of the equation is voter suppression. The other side of the equation is deliberate tactics designed to suppress the vote, particularly in minority communities. Let me mention two notable examples. Uh, the ranking member mentioned one example that is odious, encouraging people who are not legal citizens to vote. But there's another example that I know of on the opposite side. In one election in California, there was a congressional candidate in the last cycle who apparently sent out notices to immigrants who were documented, who were capable of registering to vote, and suggested to them that they could not vote unless they were born in the United States. That's not accurate. And another election in Louisiana, 2002, Senator Landrieu's re-election to the Senate, there were polling places, it was alleged and documented, where certain individuals went into minority voting precincts with bullhorns and announced that anybody in this line who has an outstanding judgment or an outstanding warrant can't vote. That's not the law in this country. There are other tactics that are hard to describe and hard to explain dealing with calling certain households and certain communities and telling them that the polling places may be moved on election day. So make sure you know where your polling place is. Uh, or there could be long lines on election day. If you don't get to the polling place by a certain time, you can't vote. Or it may not be in your interest uh, to vote because you may not be able to get back to work on time. All of those things I would label as voter suppression. And frankly, it's my understanding that all those tactics violate existing laws that we have today. So let me just ask the panel, Mr. Albrecht, uh, Mr. Ritchie, the two election officers are on the panel. Do you agree with me that voter suppression, as you understand it, violates existing federal laws and would it also violate existing state laws in your jurisdictions? I, Either I, one of you. I, I would agree. I think in, um, in the state of Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, for example, the two cases that were prosecuted of felons who were on probation or parole at the time of the election became such lightning rods for allegations of voter fraud and attention to that issue that um, it, it has now really succeeded as a suppression tool for felons who have completed their probation or parole, not believing that, in fact, they are eligible to vote in elections. And, and, and you would agree with me that communicating, knowingly communicating false information to convicted felons about their status and suggesting to them, for example, in Alabama, now there are circumstances in which convicted felons can vote. There were allegations in the 2006 election cycle, as I understand it, that there were some campaigns in some communities to say, remember, if you're a convicted felon, you can't vote, irrespective of a new law in Alabama that changed that. Mm -hmm. So you would agree that that kind of technique would be illegal in your jurisdiction? I, I would agree. Mr. <laughs> Riching? Turn your microphone on. Sorry. I would agree this is a problem, and I participated in a number of the hearings and studies for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act and the thousands of pages of voter suppression that were documented in the Midwest region and throughout the entire country were stunning to me. 
and one morning in a recent election in my neighborhood somebody put flyers underneath every windshield wiper urging people to go vote to a place that would seem logical but was absolutely not the place to vote and had never been the place to vote. I feel very fortunate to live in Minnesota where um, now Congressman Ellison passed uh, laws in our state legislature against deceptive voting practices and I'm very encouraged to see a debate and conversation about that uh, here in Washington. Uh, but it does happen, and it is um, enough of a problem that the Congress, I believe, unanimously reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. So it must be widespread and nationwide. Well, two last observations. I, I wish it were unanimous. Unfortunately, it was not. Uh, there are about mm -hmm. 60 members who vote against it. But if I could just make two quick observations. The gentleman is granted an additional minute to Thank make you. his two uh, First observation. I serve with the chairwoman on the Judiciary Committee, and we have oversight hearings periodically with the Voting Rights Division chiefs, the people who are in charge of enforcing voting rights laws. I've asked the question in several different hearings if the Ashcroft, Gonzalez Justice Departments have brought a single voter suppression case, and the answer I receive varies from I have no idea to I don't know of any. That's unacceptable. The final point, Madam Chairwoman, something else that I wish this committee would take up at some point is the very odious practice of anonymous election calls that communicate slanderous and false information. For example, suggestions that John McCain had an illegitimate child that happened in the state of South Carolina <coughs> in 2000. The gentleman's time has expired. False and defamatory. Um, Mr. Ellison has uh, participating per our you see earlier and is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could the panelists share with us if there's in, if the states um, have a standard and consistent definition of provisional ballot between them? Do you understand my question? Is there one standard uniform definition of what a provisional ballot is? Madam Chair, Representative Ellison, to my knowledge, no. I, I would agree there seems to be varying definitions between states. Um, and Mr. Moore, would you agree with that? I would. We, we define it in our in North Carolina statutes, which is what I'm used to working with, but sure. how it compares to other states. I'm not. And um, is there any standard requirement among the states um, as to when a provisional ballot will be counted and will it will not be? How is it ultimately determined? In North Carolina, it's, it's counted when the, de when the determination is made that the person's an eligible voter, or actually that the person's not an ineligible voter, I should say. So uh, most provisional ballots, my understanding, most provisional ballots are counted and they're treated much like an absentee ballot in North Carolina. Okay, so for example, North Carolina, if you vote provisionally, then some election official will determine whether you got a, whether you're an eligible voter and if it's, if it's confirmed to be that case after you've cast your ballot, it will be put in the batch with the rest of the ballots. Is that, am I right about That's that? That's correct. And the eligibility criteria would be determined in large part due to the HAVA guidelines. Now, is, do, are you aware of other states where that's not the case? I mean, I, it seems to me I'm, I'm aware of some states where provisional ballot just sort of just gets, it's really no ballot. It's just something for you to fill out to feel like you voted, but you really don't even have your ballot counted. You aware of any? Uh, you aware of any other kind of definitions like that? Perhaps there are some other panelists on another panel may speak to that issue. No, our our, our um, issuance of a provisional ballot is comparable to what's been described. It, the two identification requirements, consistent with HAVA, and if the ID is produced, the ballot is counted in the election. But what if they don't produce? What if the person votes? They are eligible, but they don't come back to give to you know for reasons of their own they can't come back and give that idea or whatever it is that was lacking which unfortunately happens often we had uh, 40 provisional ballots in one of our most recent elections and only three of them responded the next day to meet the identification requirement the 37 other ballots then were not counted in the election mr ritchie madam chair uh, representative ellison um, i believe this is why uh, you know, somewhere over a third of provisional ballots are never counted. That's the national average, and I, you're describing some of the reasons, but there's no standard, there's no national approach, so. 
And of course, it, it might be, I mean, I'm, I don't take any issue at this moment with the North Carolina procedure, but I mean, it, it could be, there could be, you could define provisional ballot as just, you know, uh, pretty loosely. I mean, you could just sort of fill it out and then maybe it never gets counted. I mean, that's my concern with this whole provisional ballot thing. Well, one of them is that it could simply result in people not voting, even if they are in all other ways qualified to vote. Do you have any response to that? I, I would. I think that the provisional ballots, though, and not counting those, the state still has to comply with HAVA. So you do have that federal law, the same thing that applies on voting on election day would apply to the provisional ballots. And secondly, I think it's important to mention when we say we don't count all provisional ballots, well, the reason is because a lot of those ballots may be invalid. The person was not eligible to vote for some reason, and that's why they're voting provisional. So I think when the percentages are thrown around that a certain percentage of provisional ballots aren't counted, and that folks are being disenfranchised, that that, that that in some way ignores the reality that the reason they're provisional ballots is that we don't know, and that once they're reviewed, it's determined that actually some of those ballots were not valid and that they should not be counted. So that would at least account for some of that percentage. Well, Representative Moore, you would agree that there's a percentage of those ballots that, uh, that were cast that the uh, individual is in all other respects eligible to vote. They just didn't happen to have what they needed on that at the moment when they were at the polls. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? I'm un I, just in answering the other question about prosecutions, I'm unaware of the data on that, but I can tell you that I know, but not I mean, but you suppose that, hey, maybe some of the reasons that these folks don't come back is because they're not eligible to vote. I'm just asking you to agree to the other side of that equation that there are a lot of those people who were eligible to vote. They just, because they got five kids, a grocery shop, two jobs, and life on top of their shoulders, they just can't make it back to the polls. You would agree with that too, wouldn't you? I would certainly hope it wouldn't happen. Oh, come on now. So. I agreed with you that, it, that on your side, you don't want to agree with me on mine. But I'm sure there are examples. Expired. The gentleman's time has expired, and all time uh, to question this panel has expired. Madam, we Madam do Chair, may I just have 10 seconds? Certainly. I, I just want to make clear, and I'm sorry that Mr. Davis has left, but I totally agree with his statements. I abhor all fraud, no matter which party, which people, whoever does it, how they do it. I abhor it, I want to stop it, and I want to make that clear, and I think that's true of everyone on this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ellers. We want to thank uh, the uh, panelists, the witnesses, and uh, we will have uh, five legislative days. If we have additional questions, uh, we will forward them to you, and we would request if that happens that you answer them as promptly as you can, and we thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us, and we will call the next panel forward at this time. As the um, witnesses are coming forward, I will begin our introductions. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Mr. Miles Rappaport. He is president of DEMOS, a nonpartisan public policy research and advocacy organization committed to building an America that achieves its highest democratic ideals. Prior to his service at DEMOS, he served for 10 years in the Connecticut legislature. As a, sta as a state legislator, he was a leading expert on electoral reform, chairing the Committee on Elections. In 1994, he was elected as Secretary of State of Connecticut, and as Secretary of State, Mr. Rappaport released two reports on the state of democracy in Connecticut. Uh, he was also Executive Director of Democracy Works, a nonpartisan group that works on democracy reform. Next, we have Daniel Takaji. He is uh, a, a, a professor of, assistant professor of law at Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law and associate director of election law at Moritz. In addition to his work with Ohio State University, Mr. K Takaji has written uh, numerous publications and articles on election issues, as well as co-authored an EAC uh, study with the Eagleton Institute of Politics on provisional voting. Prior to arriving at Moritz College of Law, Mr. Takaji was a staff attorney with the ACLU a Foundation of Southern California. Next, we have Jan uh, Leakey, uh, uh, Leakley, pardon me, um, 
who is a professor of political science at the University of Arizona. Her current research focuses on the determinants and consequences of voter turnout in the United States and effects of various state policies regarding election administration and voter registration. Uh, professor uh, Leakley's uh, work has been published in the various journals such as the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics and American uh, Politics Research. And finally, we have Mary Kiffmeyer. She is the uh, served as the uh, Secretary of State of Minnesota, the 20th Minnesota Secretary of State from 1999 to 2006. Ms. Kiffmeyer also served as the president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and she is also a former member of the Election Assistance uh, Commission Standards Board. So we welcome all of our witnesses who have um, tremendous expertise to share with us uh, today. We appreciate your being here, and we will start with Mr. Takaji. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'm very grateful to have been invited today to testify on this very important subject. Um, I'm going to start with some background on election reform, including the various values over the past several years that have informed the debate. I'll then turn to a more detailed discussion of the issues of provisional voting and Election Day registration, focusing on the nexus between the two of them. As explained below, um, provisional voting has undoubtedly had enormous benefits in some respects, but it also should be acknowledged that it carries with it some significant problems. Foremost among them are the rejection of the votes of some eligible voters, the unequal treatment of voters across counties that was referenced a moment ago, and, and perhaps most significantly, the potential for post-election litigation of the type that we saw after Florida's 2000 election over whether those ballots should count. Um, for reasons that I'll explain, I think Election Day registration has the potential to both increase turnout while minimizing our reliance on provisional ballots and avoiding some of these problems. Two of the values that have been at the center, properly so, of the debates over election reform in the past several years are access and integrity. By access, the idea that everyone should be able to vote and everyone's vote should count. By integrity, the idea that we want to minimize cheating and fraud. What I'd like to suggest today is that there's a third value that needs to be added to the mix. And that is finality, the idea that we need to resolve elections promptly, ideally with a min mi minimum of judicial involvement. Um, now, we've had um, some significant and I think very helpful legislation, both at the federal level and at the state level in recent years. Among the provisions of the Help America Vote Act was a requirement that all states have provisional voting and that they issue provisional ballots to at least two categories of voters, those who show up at the polls and find their names not on the list and those who fail to present required identification. The idea, as expressed by the Carter Ford Commission, was that no American qualified to vote anywhere in his or her state should be turned away from the polling place in that state. Now, I think provisional voting has had some significant advantages, but there are also some downsides. And one of them is that a lot of the provisional ballots that are cast by eligible voters wind up not being counted. Nationwide, 63% uh, were counted but some 37% were not counted. Now, I think there are some procedural things that can be done to improve that number and to see that more provisional ballots are counted, which I've referenced in my written testimony. Um, but it is an issue that we have to be concerned with. Perhaps an even more significant issue is disparities in how provisional ballots are treated across counties, different standards and different procedures that are, that are followed, as was referenced just a moment ago. This is a serious problem and could raise equal protection concerns of the kind that caught the Supreme Court's attention in Bush versus Gore. Third and finally, the more provisional ballots you have, the greater the potential for protracted post-election litigation over the result. 
of the type that we almost had in my own state of Ohio in 2004, where we had a whopping 159,000 or so provisional ballots cast. And there's no question that if the result had been closer, we would have seen litigation in our state over whether to count those provisional ballots, something comparable to what we saw in Florida 2000 over whether to count those punch cards. Let me turn in the short time I have left to the subject of Election Day registration. There's no reasonable basis for disputing that Election Day registration increases turnout. I know that Professor Leakley will address that question. What I want to focus on is that Election Day registration can also significantly reduce the number of provisional ballots that have to be cast and thus advance the value of finality as well as access by reducing the likelihood of this very disruptive post-election litigation. So again, um, election day registration is something that can increase access, can advance the goal of finality, and does so without increasing the risk of fraud. I'd call the, uh, I know my time is out, so I would call the committee's attention to uh, a study that I cited in my testimony from Professor Lori Minaiti investigating very carefully incidents of fraud in Election Day registration states and finding it's no greater than in any other states. Thank you very much, Professor. And Professor Leakley. Madam Chairwoman Lofgren, uh, Ranking M Member McCarthy, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to the committee an overview of what scholarly research has demonstrated regarding the effects of Election Day registration on voter turnout. Political scientists have long been interested in state-level policies and their effects on whether individuals choose to cast ballots on Election Day, perhaps the ultimate act of engagement and equality in a democratic political system. Of course, we know a relatively small proportion of individuals choose to exercise this democratic right in the United States compared to other countries. And seeking to understand whether policies might be adopted to increase voter turnout is indeed a critical endeavor, as we seem to have agreed so far today. Widespread participation in the democratic process is an important part of maintaining faith in government. Briefly, my testimony shows that we know quite a bit about the impact of Election Day registration. My own research has shown that its adoption in the 1970s by the three early adopter states, Maine, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, led to overall increases in turnout of over four percentage points, increases in the turnout of young people between eight and 12 percentage points, and increases in turnout of lower middle class people of over five percentage points. And this research is consistent with all existing research, which has shown that those states had substantial increases in turnout from the adoption of election day registration. Modern research on the impact of electoral reforms on voter turnout starts with the seminal work, Who Votes?, by professors Ray Wolfinger and Steve Rosenstone. Wolfinger and Rosenstone showed that requiring people to register well in advance of election day decreased voter turnout by about six percentage points. A substantial body of research produced in 27 years since Who Votes has unambiguously supported its conclusion that lowering the cost of voting would increase turnout. The only questions open to debate are what are the most effective ways to lower the costs of voting and which persons would be most affected by any reforms. The existing literature on the effects of Election Day registration points to four key conclusions. First, Election Day registration has a positive and significant effect on voter turnout. Not a single study based on the experience of the Wave 1 state suggests that voter turnout would decrease or remain unchanged. Instead, this research suggests that voter turnout would increase at a minimum from between three to six percentage points. Second, the magnitude of this effect is larger for the three states that adopted election day registration earlier than for those who adopted it later, Idaho, New Hampshire, Wyoming. We don't have any firm evidence as to why election day registration seems to have had less of an impact uh, in these states. However, they did adopt election day registration as an alternative means of complying with the National Voter Registration Act, Motor Voter, which allows those states to avoid complying with other substantive provisions of that law. So any analysis of the impact of election day registration in these states is implicitly comparing the adoption of election day registration to the adoption of the provisions implemented of the National Voter Registration Act. Third, the two groups who are most affected by the availability of election day registration are young individuals and individuals who have moved recently. 
Uh, Michael Alvarez at Caltech has written several reports with other co-authors and published by Demos showing that election day registration would have increased turnout in other states uh, that were considering it, New York and Iowa, and estimating that the turnout of younger individuals and of recent movers would likely increase by approximately 10 to 12 percentage points. These studies show the effects of election day registration are somewhat larger for middle and lower income and education individuals than for high income and high education individuals. My current research confirms these estimates. Fourth, existing research suggests the two potential disadvantages of election day registration, the possibility of fraudulent registration and voting, and increased implementation costs are minimal. As consistent as these research findings are, they're nonetheless somewhat captive of the empirical reality that we have only six states, uh, I guess we now have more that ha with evidence on, that we have adopted election day registration, and these two states adopted election day registration in two different periods. The common mode of analysis is to estimate the difference in turnout in election day registration states pre and post EDR adoption and to compare the difference with the difference observed in non-EDR states. Methodologically, this raises issues about what the relevant comparison groups should be. For example, some non-EDR states uh, might well adopt other policies meant to increase registration or turnout, and such actions could minimize observed differences between the two sets of states. This is precisely what we believe uh, occurred in comparing the Wave 2 state adopters with the non-EDR states uh, and their compliance with NVRA. My current research with Jonathan Nagler provides some advantages in research design over these previous approaches. Our analysis at this point strongly reinforces the four key points of previous research. An estimated positive impact of approximately four percentage points in Wave 1 states, the greatest impact for youngest age group, and greater impacts of election day registration for individuals in the middle and lower income and educational groups rather than in the highest groups. Thank you very much, Professor, and I, I just want to take uh, this opportunity to say what a pleasure it is to hear Ray Wolfinger being quoted. He was my absolute favorite professor <laughs> as an undergraduate at Stanford quite a few years ago, so thank you very much. Ms. Kiffmeyer. There's a, a button there. We, we can't hear Sorry. you, and we do want to. Thank you. Thank you very much for that reminder. I appreciate that. I'm here today to testify in favor of integrity in the election system. It is so often that we take a little piece of an election, and we focus so much on that that we lose sight that it is a system. It's an entire system. It begins with registration, and it concludes with the finality of actually having those votes recorded and included. So my approach here is let's stop just focusing on just that one piece. Let's think of it as a whole, because the ballots in the box are integrally tied to who gets the ballot. Does same-day registration increase turnout? Well, in taking a look at some of these statistics, in the years before same-day voter registration in Minnesota, it went below 60% one time. In the years after same-day voter registration, it went below 60% six times. So I think it's important to realize not only in the average, but in the individual years um, that is certainly seen. And I think part of that is attributed to Minnesota's culture. We are Germanic, Norwegian, we just are involved. If there's an organization for anybody, we've got it in Minnesota. So a lot of this, I believe, has a lot to do with just simply that kind of culture. Our high school students, almost 100% of them are registered to vote before they leave high school. It's a very active part of that. So for those young people, it's really an issue. The college students who are coming here from other states are often using same-day voter registration to vote in elections in Minnesota, election day, though they are from another state. My approach was to encourage everyone, and certainly the results and that message of hope and focus on integrity, I believe, did contribute to the upward trend in Minnesota's election turnout during the last years. I took those principles, access, accuracy, integrity, and privacy, before I thought of running for Secretary of State because I felt those embodied all of the election system. In Minnesota, when it came to paper ballots, which I took office before the 2000 election and served during the time, including the, the tragic death of Senator Wellstone, we did an election in 11 days, and as well, we did many other things. But we focused on those ballots. I stood for paper ballots when the technology trend was just out of this world. And I said, no, it can't withstand that scrutiny. We deserve better. In Minnesota, we implemented precinct optical scan paper ballots during my watch. 
the methodical recounts of ballots, aggressive training at all levels of election workers. Having been one myself for 12 years in the polling place, I knew how much training could really implement these uh, changes we needed. The auditing statewide of results and certification of code was implemented during my time as Secretary of State. Now on the other issue as well, incidences um, that you might say, is there no stealing of votes, all these kind of things you hear. Well, any of you who don't believe that they're stealing of votes, next time you leave, don't lock your house and don't lock your car door if you have that kind of absolute trust. It's important to realize that, of course, and I think what we want is a balanced system that recognizes those situations not only in the final end counting ballots, but in the beginning, which is registration. I think that recently, just a matter of fact, this week, the University of Minnesota Daily Newspaper, a commentary was written by the students in support of photo ID. These young folks stated, in sync with the minds of Jimmy Carter, James Baker, and Andrew Young, former mayor of Atlanta, Georgia. A photo ID would not be a poll tax, but a voting enabler. This comes from the mouth of the University of Minnesota college student newspaper themselves. I think that should carry a lot of weight from these young people. I know that also there are a lot of folks who will maybe tout the uh, and gloss over some of the challenges. I've experienced that uh, of major import when time is short and urgency is great and you're doing elections in the polling place on election day, you will have lines. It's hard to guess the number of poll workers you need because you don't know exactly how many are coming. Personal instance for me in Minnesota was uh, hearing on the news a polling place that was run, had run out of ballots and people were there. I walked into the polling place, about 200 people, they had run out of ballots. I sent my staff person with a $20 bill from my own pocket and said, go get pens because when the ballots get here, they're also out of pens. And so we were able to pull that together, but I felt so bad that there were people because of this situation who didn't get to vote simply because we had election day registration and the polling place was flooded. I think these, those are issues that are important. If we're going to have a let everyone vote measure, then let's make sure that everyone is an eligible measure balances those two situations as well. <clears throat> in regards to some of the cases in Minnesota, we have the Coat City that had 93 people falsely registering to vote. Fortunately, it was before Election Day. It was caught and it was prevented. We had another deputy county administrator who told a polling place person, yes, a green card is okay to register to vote. We have a car trunk that was collected with over 300 voter registrations and just stuffed in a trunk. And um, again, it was caught by a routine traffic stop at the airport. 34 non-U.S. citizens registered to vote in Minnesota, documented after HAVA because we were required to verify things. 12 of those also did vote. Those were turned into the Department of Justice. Those are some of just the larger ones and indeed also to those that were actually prosecuted. It is difficult to prosecute after an election. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for your testimony. And finally, we go to Mr. Rappaport. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you very much for the reminder. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Miles Rappaport, and I currently serve as the president of DEMOS, a network for ideas in action. Uh, DEMOS is a nonpartisan public policy center in New York, which has been dedicated since its founding in 2000 uh, to the expansion of democratic participation. We have felt all along that Election Day registration was one of the mechanisms that we could use, one of the policies we could adopt that would significantly uh, enhance voter participation. I want to make mention of the fact that I have longer written testimony, which I will summarize, and also that there are three reports, including uh, Professor Lori Minitti's report on... Without uh, objection, those report. will be entered into the record. Enter the record. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, the single largest argument for election day registration has been discussed uh, a lot, and that is that it increases voter participation. It seems that it, uh, a fundamental reality that many of us, and I served as Secretary of the State for the State of Connecticut for four years in the 90s, have observed is the precipitous drop in voting percentages that occurred in the late 19, in the early 1970s, partly because we allowed 18-year-olds to vote, partly because of disillusion around Watergate, and we have never regained those levels. So we have actually nationwide a serious drop which now we're hoping to come um, and push back up a little bit. Um, I think we also understand that people's lives are complicated and that the more you can make something convenient for people, the more they will access it. The private sector understands this very well. When I was young, I used to get a paycheck every Friday afternoon at 2.30, race to the bank, stand online for about an hour with all the other people who got their Friday paychecks because you knew 
that if you didn't get your paycheck cash on Friday, you didn't have any money for the weekend. Um, I tell my son, who's sitting back here, uh, that that's the way it used to be, and he looks at me like it's like an Abraham Lincoln log cabin story. You know, like, um, so no self-respecting bank would, uh, would require people to, uh, to take extra steps in order to get their money, uh, but when it comes to voting, we require people to register it, in some cases, 30 days in advance. Um, the turnout figures, the participation rates are clearly um, you know, 10 to 12 points higher in the states where they do have election day registration. Not all of that uh, can be attributable to election day registration itself. I think the academic studies that uh, Professor Laley uh, referred to about 4% with uh, larger increases for certain parts of the population is, are, are accurate. There are two corollary benefits to election day registration beyond the increase in participation, which is of course first and foremost. One, uh, it does reduce the, the problems with provisional ballots. Uh, there have been huge problems with provisional ballots uh, on the counting. We heard that a third of the provisional ballots in 2004 presidential election were not counted. Um, the possibility of uh, huge, uh, lengthy battles around who was eligible to provisional ballot, to cast a provisional ballot and have it counted, are, uh, is a dramatic possibility. There's also, as, uh, as Representative Ehlers uh, mentioned, uh, additional costs, but I don't think that that has been a central focus here. It doesn't need to be. The second corollary benefit is interesting, and I say this as a former candidate, which is I do believe that it widens and enriches the political debate that we'll have. You're taught as a candidate, only talk to people who are registered on that list. If you go out knocking on doors, you walk right by a house, even if people want to talk to you, if they're not on that list. Those people are ignored as far as the political process is concerned. That's efficient as a candidate but it's not very healthy for our democracy. So I think we want to create a situation in which the campaigns and candidates talk to everyone because everyone is a potential voter. I think that flow of information and flow of discussion would be uh, much, much better. So let me deal with the arguments against voter uh, election day registration that have been mentioned. One has been the administrative complexity at the polls. Where will there be difficulties? Clearly, as with any new uh, policy, um, the poll workers need to be trained. The procedures need to be put in place. Uh, a separate desk or whatever needs to be for the registrants so they're not standing online creating uh, lines. Uh, but that has been shown in every state that has had uh, election day registration, some for 30 years, to be entirely manageable. The second is the cost, where there are clearly are additional costs of additional personnel. I think they're minor and I think they're offset by the costs of hiring additional people to get the voters on the rolls where there's not election day registration and the counting of provisional ballots afterwards. Uh, the most important argument that's been adduced has been the argument that this will open the way to fraud, and I want to address that very directly. Um, it is certainly a theoretical possibility. I don't think anybody could say, sit, say, don't worry, there's no possibility whatsoever. There are, in our current system, without election day registration in the states, as there are. We've had problems in Connecticut, uh, mostly minor, mostly with absentee ballots. But the overwhelming thrust of the evidence here is that it simply has not happened and is very unlikely to happen. Um, I think that uh, the, the study by Laura, Professor Manitti documents that she looked at 4,000 news reports for all six EDR states over the period of 1999 to 2005, found only 10 incidents that were even um, um, substantive and investigated and prosecuted, and only one of those involved a, an impersonation, and that was in New Hampshire, where a son voted for his father. So I think that the fraud issue is a potential one. Um, we are, as, uh, as elected officials, election officials, or people who are interested in it, having to balance. You will have the responsibility to balance. But we have a situation here where I think there is very little evidence that fraud will increase, a huge amount of evidence that this will draw uh, millions of new people into the polls, and on balance for the health of our democracy, it seems that election day registration would be a very, very good policy to adopt nationwide as well as state by state. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your testimony, and thanks to all of you for uh, very interesting testimony. We now go to the time in our hearing when we have a chance to ask questions, and I will turn first to my colleague from California, uh, who represents San Diego, uh, Susan Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I'm just beginning to thaw, so <laughs> I appreciate your all being here. Thank you very much. Uh, one question really occurred to me while you were talking. Have we done very much tracking of those people who vote in same-day registration, whether or not they continue um, to um, return to the polls for um, subsequent elections? Is, do we have any data on that as far as you know? I'm not aware of any tracking in terms of panel data on individuals. I would note 
we do have some work uh, which suggests that the key is getting those people in the door the first time. And at that point, the political system, the political interest is enhanced, mobilization is enhanced, they be, they, they've entered in. Um, so our best guess from fairly strong theoretical arguments is that uh, there would likely be a subsequent uh, effect. If I could just add yes. one thing. Uh, there is also evidence that the benefits from Election Day registration in terms of increasing turnout do persist over time, specifically from the three states that uh, Professor Leakley mentioned in her te testimony earlier. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah. Um, Representative Davis, Chairman Loughran, I believe that the, the, there is an effect that no matter how you register to vote, no matter where your first time voting is, that once you begin that, you're more likely to continue. But I don't think it makes it any more so, it's an opinion, how you get registered or which day. But I do think um, that it does make a difference. And that's why we very much focused on making sure that those <coughs> young students in Minnesota were registered uh, and had those opportunities right away. First, um, first time voters are, are more likely to continue as they go along. But I think the methodology of where they register mm -hmm. isn't proven to be as big a factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I mean, you're capturing, though, a lot more people, and so I think that you would, you would suggest that uh, if they continue to be voters, uh, that you certainly would have them when you might not have otherwise, and I think we still have questions about why we weren't able to get to them, uh, you know, 30 days prior, but, you know, that's another issue. Uh, you know, one of the uh, things I think we would all agree on is n no fraud is acceptable, um, but I think we've also talked about the suppression uh, a voting issue as well. And I'm, you know, in your experience, uh, is, is there an acceptable level in some ways? I mean, we know that there's going to be problems, uh, it, but they seem to be rather minimal. So, and we know that there's tremendous suppression that can exist uh, in communities just as well. I mean, is it, is that, uh, something that in your positions you've discussed. I mean, is because it would seem to me that while we don't like it, there may be an acceptable level, but it's also clear that, you know, what are, what are the, you know, the red flags that go up, you know, when you know that something is really going wrong and maybe we need to kind of look at what are those red flags and, and again, how do you, how would you act to secure uh, whether it's um, same day registration or even registration generally that, that perhaps we're not addressing? Uh, let me take the position that no voting fraud is ever acceptable. I, I think we're in agreement on mm -hmm. that point. Uh, I would also suggest that no matter what kind of system you have, there are always going to be a few people out there who are trying to cheat. I think it is important when we're talking about fraud to be clear about what we mean. Um, and to, in, in particular, separate it into three categories. There's, first of all, the voter who goes to the polls on election day and tries to cheat, pretending to be someone they're not. That is extremely rare. A bit more common, though also rare, is people trying to cheat through absentee ballots. And if you're an individual voter trying to cheat, that's the way you're most likely to pursue. Uh, also rare is the third kind, but again, a bit more common than the first, which is insider fraud, people on the inside stuffing ballots or things like that. What should be emphasized is that the risks of fraud arising from election day registration are very small because if voters are gonna try to cheat, they more often than not do it through absentee ballots, not through going in, into the polls on election day pretending to be someone they're not or otherwise trying to cheat, and that's demonstrated by Professor Minaiti's study. So I don't think there's any acceptable level of fraud, but I also don't think that the evidence supports the conclusion that Election Day registration increases it. It is clear that Election Day registration does increase turnout, and this is where we have a huge problem in our society that we have not satisfactorily addressed. Not nearly enough people come out to vote, and moreover, certain groups, including racial minorities, poor people, younger people, people with disabilities are underrepresented in our polity and in our voting polity, and that's a serious problem. Election day registration is the best way I know of, based on the social science evidence, mm -hmm. to increase uh, regist registration and participation through election administration. Can I add a comment, Madam Chair, Representative Davis, a quick comment on that. 
it yeah. seems to me that if we uh, uh, make the ass uh, assumption that no, that we want to guard against fraud as effectively as possible, there are still two paths to go. One is to uh, uh, create an election system that works as smoothly as and efficiently um, and where we give the prosecuting authorities, the election enforcement commissions in the states and the, the uh, attorney general in the state, the resources that they need to really actively go and uh, search out the fraud, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and do it. The second path is to sort of tamp down on the process of allowing people to vote in a more general way, catching the fraud, but also I think uh, uh, limiting and significant the amount of people that will vote. And I think the first path, we have the capacity to do with the digitized statewide voter lists, with the uh, increasing sophistication of uh, the voter identification uh, processes and mechanisms. I think those are the better ways to go. The, the gentlelady's time has expired. I turn now to the ranking member, a uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the whole panel. I appreciate all the testimony. Um, like. Um, Congresswoman Davis said, you know, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to vote. And we have evolved so far in everything we do in America. You think today, and Ms. Davis and I had a conversation just the other day about other countries of how you see the turnout so much larger than America, and people waiting in line, people having to walk to the polls. And we, you can vote absentee, states let you vote early, out there for two weeks at a time, in shopping centers, everywhere else. But w one testimony struck me. Um, very unique, um, Ms. Kiffmeyer, if I pronounce it correctly, um, taking it from the whole perspective. Because in this committee, we're also looking at contested elections. We have one issue in Florida 13. So we're looking at is there an undervote or what uh, of going through. But do we ever also look at, if we're going to do a complete accounting, if we're looking at just the final product, was this person actually able to vote or should they have? And I do have a, a real concern in this whole debate of whether it be a provisional or not, because once it is inside the ballot, you don't know which ballot it was. There's no way of checking. And when you look how close these elections are, then you have the whole argument about, are these people informed? Or are, are, are we not allowing them to be more informed? With The more we get on voter registration, that's how people use the um, voter rolls. Some people use them for wrong reasons. But th that, that's the main reason why we're able to get information out. My question would be uh, to Ms. Um, Ms. Kiffmeyer, have you found, because you've had uh, same-day voter for quite some time, did you find with the college students, and you, you, you put about the ID there, w w did you find any fraud within there that people from other states, because coming in there, going to college, voting back home, and also right. voting there as well? Well, uh, Representative um, Lofgren and Representative McCarthy. Um, certainly, we have cases of. Could you turn your microphone on so we can hear? Very um, good. Thank on. you. A, oh, well, pull a little, little bit closer then. It, we want to make sure we can hear you. Excuse me. Thank you very much. There are instances of convictions, but we, we have found, though, is that the, uh, the tools that we need in order to verify some of these things are non existent. In other words, is there fraud is one question. The second thing is, do you have a system to catch it? Do you have a system that can give you that degree of certainty? When you have students coming from other states and voting in your state, there's no ID requirement. They come in on election day, the ballot is live and counted. Then afterwards, a non-forwardable postcard is sent to them. What happens to that non-forwardable postcard? I mean, those are the kinds of researches. Uh, n newspaper reports, you don't, by the time things get to a newspaper, there's lots of stuff going on that never hit the newspaper. Now, you need to, to dig a little deeper and also be wiser about the actual system and what is really happening to know what to do there. But you know those tools to verify that those students, did they vote in their home state? Did they vote also Minnesota? Uh, can we know and shouldn't we know? Uh, where are the tools that enable us to give what I believe we owe to the American people? I mean, we do it on the side of the ballots. We have the recounts and we have all this, and we have attorneys and we have all this stuff going on, but it seems like on this side, uh, when it comes to registration, it, there is almost um, a sense of uh, faith-based uh, trust in regards to registration, that ergo they registered, ergo it must be true, without the same level of scrutiny that we give in the so, ballots themselves. So we're pretty much leaving the, doc, the door unlocked like your analogy earlier because we don't have the information to even check to see about the accuracy within there. Um, 
I, I know Hava um, has, if you're a first-time voter um, and you register, first-time registered and first-time voter, they make you form a check of an ID or you get mailed back. W would you think if a person goes to the ballot and they're a first-time registering to vote, whether, should there be any other check there? Should people show an ID? Well, certainly when you have your um, check and you go to cash your check, uh, in most every instance, you're required to sew some sort of identification to tie those two records together. In other words, here's my name on the roster, and here is my name on this ID, and you tie those things together. That's just a common sense thing that is used everywhere else in our society, and the only place it is wholly absent many times is in the polling place on election day, where you're getting a vote, a real live ballot. Yeah, because it's only the registering by mail first time that we do that check. Now, the only other question I have, maybe to Mr. Rappaport, would you support showing an ID? And um, I know a lot of people use um, driver's license. Now, I come from a state that um, first proposed um, giving driver's license to illegals. It got repealed. Um, where's your position on that? I think it's reasonable. Uh, I think it is reasonable for uh, a first-time uh, registrant uh, to show identification. I think the question comes is what is what are the acceptable forms of identification? We negotiated this very carefully when I was uh, the chairman of the uh, Government Administration Elections Committee in the Connecticut Legislature about what form of ID. And where we ended up was a, reason, a, a list of acceptable IDs, driver's license probably the most used, uh, electronic benefit transfer cards, student IDs, but with anything that has a, both a signature and either a picture or an address. Um, and then the last the fa sort of fail-safe is an attestation requirement where a voter can, if they are absolutely lacking an ID, signs an affidavit stating under penalty of perjury that I am who I am. And if, there, if someone else were to come and vote there, you have at least the beginnings of a, of a signature to do it. I will say that in the 15 years since that system has been enacted in Connecticut, there has been not a single uh, prosecution uh, for false identification. There have been election fraud issues in Connecticut. They have been exclusive entirely in the misuse of absentee ballots. And just one quick follow -up. Would you, I know that was 15 years ago, would you still have that opinion now with the debate going on about illegals being able to have a driver's license? Um, would, it, would a driver's license still be okay for you for the IDing for that purposes? Yeah, I imagine that the, uh, uh, yes, it, it would. I think there probably would be some differentiation differentiation in the license. But I'd also say this, that um, um, I think that the people who have studied this uh, generally feel that people who are not citizens and who are subject to, to uh, deportation or subject to real problems are very unlikely to expose themselves by coming out to vote. I think that it's hard to get them to respond to many things at all. So I don't think it's uh, well, I just think the whole uh, Madam Chair, I, I do want to thank you for, it must have been our miscommunication that you did from six to four. And, and if we're moving beyond um, three in the majority and one on the minority for witnesses, I, it would be my intent to withdraw my Rule 11, and I thank you for that. I'll be happy, you know, we should have a discussion of this at a later time. Um, Mr. Ellison is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and let me thank all the panelists, and I hope you all will forgive me for thanking Ms. Kiffmeyer to be here in particular. She's from Minnesota, and uh, she and I worked together over the years. She could uh, report how we showed up in places around the district and tried to encourage people to go vote, and I want to thank you for the work you did then and for coming out today. Um, <coughs> Uh, Mr. Uh, Toka, uh, Professor Tokaji, um, one question I want to ask you is, you know, um, d there there seems to be sort of sort of a dispute in the statistics about whether or not uh, same day voter increases voter turnout. Um, Secretary Kiffmeyer said that um, we already had high voter turnout in Minnesota, and so same day voter registration didn't really change that. What if we look at it in a more broad sense? What, you know, look at the look at the more comprehensive look at the, all the states that have it. Are you can you say with you know some authority that it actually does increase voter turnout? I say with absolute 
confidence that Election Day voter registration increases turnout. And I believe I've looked at all the social science evidence that exists on the subject. I think Secretary of State Ritchie explains one of the blips in Minnesota, which had to do with the fact that we were lowering the voting age at around the same time as some of those studies. But there's no reasonable basis for disputing based on the evidence that Election Day registration increases turnout. It, it is, you know, I, 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 I'd say it's a social scientific fact just as evolution is a natural scientific fact, is it at that level of clarity? There's reason for- <laughs> There's people who debate that too. Right, well, you know, there are always <laughs> gonna be people who debate certain things, right? Um, you know, there may be some reason for quibbling about exactly how much it increases yeah. turnout, but there's no reasonable basis on the evidence for questioning that it increases turnout, Representative. Thank you, Professor, and uh, thank you. Everybody had an excellent presentation, I wanna say. What about uh, your thoughts on this, Professor Laley? Uh, do you, I mean, uh, do you agree or concur with uh, Professor Takaji on this issue? Voter? I do. This is uh, one of the few places where in studying electoral behavior in the United States, there is a clear uh, unanimity in, in all of the studies about uh, increases that result from election day registration. And it's based on empirical evidence uh, things that we actually observe in the world as opposed to concerns or questions or allegations. Uh, how, how about you, Secretary Rappaport? Is that your, do you concur with uh, uh, Professor Laley and Professor Takachi? I do, and I think, the, uh, I think the evidence is consistent. I want to call the committee's attention to a chart, which is actually not in what I introduced, but I can leave it and copies can be made. Well, excuse me. By, uh, can, I, can I offer a unanimous consent sure. that it be introduced? Yes. Okay, okay. that'll be part of the record. Without we, objection. We, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, we did a chart just to look at this very question about will, were states higher uh, anyway, and does Election Day registration make a difference? And what we found that if you go back to 1968, the presidential elections, all six of the states that had Election Day registration in 2002 were indeed higher than the national average uh, by anywhere from six to nine points. But once they adopted Election Day registration, it, was, uh, the, it went up to 12 to 13 to 14, in some cases 17 and 18 percent higher. So I think there's a very clear distinction to be made. They, uh, uh, Secretary Kiffmeyer is correct that some of the states already had very high voting traditions, but there's no question that EDR has significantly increased this, and I'll leave this chart with the committee if you'd like. So okay. Secretary Kiffmeyer, why are these three uh, distinguished, learned uh, <laughs> uh, individuals wrong? I don't think I take a position that way. I think that what I am looking at. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. So you agree with them? I don't think that's a point that I was making. Well, do you agree with them? I think that they're giving a lot of facts and a lot of background that, uh, especially when you get into some of these um, studies that they've done, such as a study done by Miles. And when you're reporting another study where they were using newspaper reports to do their study as a basis for what you had found. So I think all of their, their uh, analysis, and I think that actually the I'm case sorry, Secretary, Madam Secretary, forgive me for my interruption. I only have five minutes. Of course, I would never interrupt you. As you know, I respect you so much. But do you disagree with them, or do you agree with them? I think I don't have all their um, studies and facts and figures that are around. Okay. I, so you, I so to you would say that you don't, you don't know? Well, I haven't looked at all of their studies and all their research. Well, you'd have to either agree, disagree, or you don't know. I think I've stated, though, that they've given a lot of facts and a lot of information, and you're asking me to just ratify all of their statements and their no, opinions. No, I'm not asking to ratify. You could say they are wrong, and yeah. they got it all wrong, and they looked at the data the, wrong. The gentleman's time has expired. And ten more seconds. Uh, by you asking it, ten more seconds, but since you and Ms. Kaifmeyer know each other very well, you can also finish this um, at a later date. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right, Madam Chair. Madam Chair is absolutely correct. I was just hoping to get uh, Secretary Kiffmeyer on the record taking a position on this issue. But if, but I, it made one last chance to see if she, which. I think <laughs> Ms. Kiffmeyer has probably concluded her. Okay. But, and we will now turn to Mr. Ehlers. Well, it's very tempting to satisfy Mr. Ellison's request by just saying they're wrong <laughs> and get it over with. <laughs> But no, just expanding on that a bit, I, uh, I have to throw my, I, I, I just cast my lot with Ms. Kiffmeyer. I have the same 
hands-on experience that she has had. I've seen it, and uh, I respect these gentlemen. I'm, I'm, since I'm supposed to be an egghead myself, I certainly don't want to cast you for castigate any of the witnesses for uh, their research. But there's something to be said for the hands-on, having to deal with <coughs> the problem on election day, which is a very frantic time for all election workers, and deal with all the problems that come up. And there are, there are lots of them, innumerable problems that come up. You know, can't describe all of them. But I will certainly cast, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> certainly cast my lot with Ms. Kipmeyer in the practicalities and the difficulties that, that you encounter in this situation. And I, that doesn't mean I'm against uh, same-day registration. I'm just cautioning everyone here that it opens multiple opportunities for, for fraud. And I'm not talking so much about the fraud on the part of an individual. I'm talking about organized fraud, busing, gathering people up and bus. Well, I shouldn't use the term bus. What I've seen is vans, not buses. But picking up people uh, and, 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 uh, and getting them to vote when they shouldn't vote and telling them that it's legal for them to vote when, in fact, it's not legal for them to vote. Uh, you have to, you, know, you can't just have the pie in the sky, sky attitude. This is great, it improves turnout. You have to look at all aspects of it, and that was what I want to thank Ms. Kiffmeyer for doing because she has given us those aspects, and I respect that. Thank you. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, I just want to ask a couple of questions, and then we will thank you all and go to our floor vote. Um, we talked earlier about the provisional ballots um, and that many of them are not counted. Now, maybe, we don't know why they're not counted, but uh, for the two professors, have you given any thought to whether there should be some kind of nationwide standard for how provisional ballots are dealt with and <coughs> if so what those standards ought to be? Um. Let me say a couple things on this. First, I am actually someone who is generally very cautious about recommending that we implement national standards when it comes to the administration of elections. Our elections have traditionally been run at the state and local level, and I think that, generally speaking, our state and local officials do a fantastic job of doing I do, too. Um, I, I do think that there is some place for the federal government here. Frankly, I think that... Um, HAVA should have been written to make clear that people who mistakenly cast a provisional ballot in the wrong precinct should have those ballots counted at least for races they were entitled to vote in. Uh, we, we do have statistical evidence, which I've cited in my testimony, that states that do count those ballots count a much higher percentage of provisional ballots. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'd be wary of too much federal legislation on this question. I do think it's essential, however, that every state have clear standards for what provisional ballots should count and that those standards uh, and procedures as well be followed uniformly throughout the state so as to avoid an equal protection problem. Mm -hmm. Professor? Mr. Rappaport, you've made a, a multi-decade study of these issues. Do you? Yes, I, I think that the absence of national standards on the counting of provisional ballots and on several other kinds of issues uh, is a real problem. So I would, uh, uh, despite having been a state elected official and not wanting too much federal control, right. um, I think that uh, voters in, in all jurisdictions are entitled to know that their provisional ballots will be counted more or less in the same way. And it's clear from the testimony that's been given here that one of the real virtues of election day registration, if it were adopted, would be to minimize the problems with provisional ballots. I think that would be a right. good thing as well. Ms. Kiffmeyer, you were president of the Secretaries of State's Association. I know that the Secretaries of State don't like federal interference. On the other hand, there is an equal protection issue if there is wide variation. What would your thoughts be on some kind of national standard that we work with the Secretaries of State to, to develop? Well, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, uh, one of the things you saw in the implementation of HAVA was there was a standard in regards to the equipment, but they also gave a methodology by <coughs> which 
the uh, standards board, which was made up of local and state election officials, worked together uh, to re review those and under the EAC. And so I think there was a methodology there that enabled the states and locals to do that. It was interesting. It was very important to us to make sure that, that, was a, that it was still up to the states to voluntarily comply with those standards. Now, interesting enough, all 50 states have. Why? Because they've had input, they've been able to establish that, and it was made up of those who actually administer elections. Mm -hmm. So I think in that particular case, you see that even though it was voluntary, the, the heart and the desire to do good elections, um, matter of fact, making it not voluntary uh, would have actually put a big resistance mm -hmm. to the whole situation. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is an example. Um, I don't know. I think that really, we don't have federal elections. We have state elections for federal offices. Federal officers, yeah. I, I would just uh, like to, to um, ask Mr. Takaji, you've, you've done so much research on this. When I registered to vote in California a long time ago, it was before we had postcard registration, but now, I mean, that's how everybody registers that way. And there's no, I mean, you just fill it out and sign it, and there's no, you don't show up anywhere, you don't show any ID. And it sounds to me that what is being proposed on election day actually is a much higher standard. I mean, you have to show up in person and sign it. It's a lot more rigorous than what California has. Is that just wrong? I, I think you're ex exactly right, Madam Chair, and um, a, a couple of other social scientists have, have made precisely that point, that when you register on Election Day, you're actually appearing before someone in person representing that you are who you say you are, signing a statement under penalty of perjury right. that you are, and providing some sort of identifying information. Uh, when things go through the mail, there are all sorts of opportunities. I don't think they happen very often, but at least opportunities right. for improprieties that don't exist when someone's doing it in person. I'll just say my time has expired, but I'll, I'll just uh, say that this whole issue of I just have to make this statement because in addition to chairing the election subcommittee, I chair the immigration subcommittee in the Judiciary Committee. And all that we have learned, I mean, people are, you know, who are undocumented, they're risking their lives crossing the desert to, to get a job. They're not risking their lives to come over and vote. Um, it's, it's a whole different dynamic. And once you're here, they are laying low. They do not want to be found out. Um, so I just think it's important to state that. That's, there's no evidence to support that. But I'll get off my soapbox and thank all four of you for being here today. Uh, we have five legislative days to uh, pose additional questions. If we do that, we would ask that you try and respond as promptly as possible. A lot of people don't realize that the witnesses who come before our committees are volunteers and come here just to help our country. Uh, by sharing their expertise, and so we thank you very much, each of you, for doing that, and this uh, hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>